All right, you guys, so today we are going to wrap up World War II and look at the diplomacy and effects and the decisions that the big three was making on how to end the war and then also what the world should look like once World War II has ended. So the first two conferences I'm going to talk about, they're just background information. You are not responsible for Casablanca or Moscow. So looking at the Casablanca conference, and here we're looking at in the January of 1943, uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and I refer to him as FDR, and Churchill had made the decision that it's going to be unconditional surrender for all enemies. And I had pointed that out on Tuesday when we were uh, looking at the turning points and um, watching clips from World War II from space, that this time around, all enemies must understand that they lost this war. And when this war ends, it will be on uh, the schedule and of the agenda on the allies. The Axis powers do not get to dictate how this war ends. So it is completely unconditional surrender. And that's why we're seeing a very heavy presence, particularly toward the end of the war, on the destruction of areas that have uh, a high population of civilians. So the firebombing of Dresden and then the destruction in Berlin, it's because it's unconditional surrender. They had also made the decision and, <clears throat> excuse me, and really this is going to come from Roosevelt that um, they are not opening a second front up in France until they've gone through Italy. So Italy had to be invaded first and then they would focus on that second front. Remember I had talked about how President Roosevelt was very conscious of how many body bags were going to end up back in the United States, particularly in a war that's taking place in Europe. And that wasn't where our issue was. Our issue was over in the Pacific against Japan. So he was very strategic about where we would first enter into the war in Europe, knowing that going into France, where you had that heavy presence of the Nazis, that that would be a huge you know, disaster for us if that was our first encounter. And we saw that in the video that we actually you know, we're in North Africa, then we went into Italy uh, before we went into France. And, you know, it wasn't the best experience for our guys in Northern Africa. The Moscow Conference, uh, October to November of 1943, this is where uh, the Soviet Union, Stalin says, yes, uh, when this war is over, after Germany has been defeated, I will join the United States and Great Britain against Japan. And that world organization that Churchill and Roosevelt had discussed during the Atlantic Charter, Stalin said, yes, the Soviet Union would be willing to participate in an organization of that fashion. So this would be a world organization that would replace the League of Nations because clearly the League of Nations was a failure leading up to the outbreak of World War II. All right, so now we're going to look at three different conferences, and you'll notice that there are stars around each of their names, Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam. You are responsible for the information that happens during these conferences and knowing the order and the people involved. So looking at Tehran, and we're seeing that this is um, November to December 1943, we have our first meeting of the big three. And so that's going to be the U.S. President, uh, FDR, Roosevelt. We will have Great Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. And then we have the General Secretariat of the Soviet Union or USSR, Joseph Stalin. And we have those three guys right there in our picture. So the breakdown of this one, uh, I have it where what Stalin is wanting to address, what Churchill, and then what Roosevelt. So at Tehran, Stalin wants to put it on the table that, you know, yes, when this war is over, I am committed to enter the war against Japan. Yes, going to do it. Absolutely. But then he also addressed what Eastern Europe should look like. 
remember when uh, I had used the term buffer when he was venturing into Poland at the beginning of this war? Well, he is still insisting on having that buffer. And so he is going to say that the Soviet Union should be the ones controlling Eastern Europe, that the Soviet Union needs to have friendly countries along her border. And these are countries that share similar values, that will share similar government. And it's going to be, in his mind, a government that would be controlled from Moscow. Uh, and that Germany needs to be carved up. That a united Germany is too strong of a power. And if she's too strong of a power, then she could attack again. And having control over Eastern Europe would provide that buffer and a place to fight if Germany would ever attack. So let's avoid that and just carve Germany up. And then we never have to worry about Germany ever being a strong powerhouse again. But Winston Churchill said, no, don't like what's on your agenda, Stalin. I think Eastern Europe needs to have free elections. Actually, I don't think it. I demand it. Free elections in Eastern Europe. Let the people in Eastern Europe decide what they want to do. <clears throat> and really, when you look at Eastern Europe, these are the territories that the Soviet Union is liberating from Nazi occupation. So from the 1930s, these areas that had fallen under Nazi control are now just being shifted over to Soviet control. Because as they're liberating them, Stalin has no intent on letting them go. But Churchill says, no, you really need to let the people decide. Let them vote. And he's also adamant that we need a strong Germany. You know, we saw what happened the last time when we created a weak Germany. We ended up back here fighting again, this time with a totalitarian dictator in control. So now we need to focus on strengthening Germany, where Germany isn't going to have any of those issues. And he also understands that in order for everyone's economy to start to prosper after this war, Germany has to be included in the mix. So a strong Germany could also bring a strong economic Germany, which would be very beneficial to Great Britain. Roosevelt is sitting here like, what in the world did I just get myself involved in? Um, and he ends up playing the mediator between the two. You know, he can understand the issues that both sides have. And it's going to be very difficult to say to one, yes, you can take the land that you free from Nazi occupation. And the other one, no, you cannot. Because England is going to take some territories that they free during this war and say, Stalin, you can't do that. So a little bit of uh, hypocrisy going on here. And so Roosevelt is trying to play that mediator. And what he wants these two to like, we need to, you know, kind of come in together is we need to work on creating the United Nations because that will be an organization that we will be able to use to oversee all of the other issues that can come up after this war. So then we move into February of 1945, and we still have our big three. We're still there, Churchill, uh, Roosevelt, and Stalin. And this time we're at Yalta. So at Yalta, Stalin comes to the table with a different tune. Yes, we will hold free elections in Eastern Europe. Once we finish World War II, we will look at how Stalin defines free elections in Eastern Europe. They're actually called salami tactics, and we will we will look at that. But his definition of free elections is not our definition of free elections. But at this moment, in February of 1945, Stalin says, yes, we can hold free elections in Eastern Europe. They also hold the first meeting of the United Nations in the United States in April of that year. And one of the components of the League of Nations, and we're going to look at the League a little later on after uh, this test, uh, is that they create a, perm a security council. And within the security council, there are permanent members. And yes, they are still on board today. So those permanent members, you have the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. 
the big three are definitely on there. And they also decide to bring France on board out of respect for the position that France held before the collapse at the beginning of this war. And then they had to figure out, okay, so who can we pull in to represent Asia? And it definitely wasn't going to be Japan in February of 1945 because they are at war with Japan. So Japan's not going to get pulled in to the mix as a permanent member of the Security Council. The Soviet Union said, hey, guess what? We cover two continents. So why can't we be a representative for Europe and Asia? And the United States and Great Britain said, absolutely not. You are not going to represent Asia. So they chose to go the route of China. So as the members of the Security Council and the permanent members, and there are other members that are rotated in and out every so many years, but these five nations, whether they get along with each other or not, are the permanent members of the Security Council. And as security members, each of them holds a very powerful ability to veto things that come to the Security Council. And we're going to see during the Cold War that all of them are going to throw out that veto and it's going to send an issue to another committee because they're going to block each other almost every chance they can get, especially if it interferes in what they want to achieve. So Germany, what in the world happened to Germany? So let's look over here at this little colorful map down here in the corner. This Stalin got Germany was divided into four occupied zones. And if you look here within these occupied zones, so there's a section, the green will belong to Great Britain. Uh, the blue will be given to France to oversee. And then it's kind of like a mustard color uh, or gold color. That will be the United States section. And then the red will belong to the Soviet Union. So it's four occupied zones that will be overseen by Great Britain, the Soviet Union, France, and the United States. You are responsible for the taking care of your particular zone. Now, if you look in the red zone, you can see that there is a little colors over in uh, another section here, right here. All these little colors. They did the same thing to Berlin. Berlin is also divided into four occupied zones controlled by the same four countries that have a portion of Germany. Right, like this is not going to lead to any problems. Are you kidding me? By the end of the war, these countries barely are getting along. So when we finish this war, we're going to look at what happens here in Berlin because uh, we're going to see a huge clash. Yeah, this is not going to uh, start off very pretty at the end of World War II. Couple other decisions that will be made at this conference. Poland, what should we do with Poland? Well, of course, Stalin says they need to have a communist government and Churchill and Roosevelt were like, no, it needs to be non-communist. So let's compromise. Let's create a government that includes communists and non-communists, one where they have to work together. Because again, Stalin's saying, I need countries along my border that are friendly toward my way of life, our type of government. And Churchill's like, we, okay, we are not going to have communism spread all over Europe. And Roosevelt's right on board with him. So the idea is Poland would have a coalition government that would be made up of communists and non-communists and a government that would be freely elected by the people. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out once this war is over. And the Soviet Union, uh, they are to maintain the territory they had pre-1939. So before they decided to uh, take portions of Poland and go after the Baltic states and Finland, yeah, they have to give that stuff up because that was an act of aggression that they were not supposed to be involved in. And then Potsdam, little change here at Potsdam. So uh, <clears throat> toward the end of the war in Europe, um, we have Roosevelt who had passed away and uh, his vice president, Harry S. Truman, 
will then take over as our new president. And uh, for him, there was a lot of like, whoa, what happened here? Didn't know we had an atomic bomb. So a lot of surprises. And then Churchill did go to Potsdam, but while he was there early on, uh, England had an election and his party lost control. Or they lost majority of parliament. So that meant the new political group that has control needs to elect a new prime minister and they chose Attlee. And uh, so now Stalin is sitting there like, I have two newbies. Ha 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 ha. I'm going to change my mind about all the stuff I agreed to at Yalta. So now we have Truman, Attlee, and Stalin are the new big three at Potsdam. And so these are the three who are going to make decisions. One of the decisions that's coming out of Potsdam is that Japan is going to be issued a warning that it is unconditional surrender, which was decided long time ago by Churchill and Roosevelt that all enemies had to surrender unconditionally. And we also throw into the mix or face utter devastation. So it's at Potsdam that it's revealed that the United States actually has the atomic bomb. And Stalin was furious because he felt that Roosevelt should have shared that information. I'm sure Truman was thinking that in the back of his head. Yeah, Roosevelt probably should have shared it at least with him as his VP. But Churchill, you know, Churchill at first was a little upset, but then he's not in the mix anymore. Now it's Attlee and everything's new to Attlee because he hadn't been in the position. But one of the things that Stalin wanted to be included in was the decision to actually drop it, that it needed to be a decision that would come from all of them and not just the nation who actually held the atomic bomb. Well, Truman is not Roosevelt. <clears throat> and as we saw that Roosevelt really did set out to try to play the mediator, yeah, Truman's not going to. He is the president of the United States and we have the most powerful weapon in the world. So the last thing he's going to do is play to any of Stalin's little tantrums and anything that he wants to throw on the table. So Stalin also puts out there, guess what? We're not having free elections in Eastern Europe. Not going to happen. It's going to be communist governments and we're going to put them in place. And at that point, Truman let him have it. I am not Roosevelt. I will not kiss your ass. There will be free elections in Eastern Europe. So right there, Truman and Stalin will be at odds. And the fact that Stalin wants Truman to speak to him, to have him just help decide on when the bomb was going to be dropped, yeah, that's not happening. Truman makes that decision when he is leaving Potsdam, when he gets on the plane, we're dropping the bomb. Not gonna talk to Stalin about it. It's our nation's weapon. We decide it's our war. They also make the decision that what are they going to do with Germany? Uh, there's going to be war crime trials. They're going to demilitarize and they're going to remove any aspect that is attached to the Nazi party in Germany. Completely wipe it clean and rebuild Germany into a different nation. And again, Truman makes the decision, dropping the bomb, and he sends the order as he's leaving. What we see after this war, um, Europe's in ruins, and we know that Japan's also going to be too, particularly in the areas where the two atomic bombs were dropped. Millions were going to be homeless. Millions are going to be, have to be relocated. So we are looking at a lot of refugees. And how in the world are we going to help this nation, this continent, rebuild? I mean, people are going back trying to find their homes. Neighborhoods are destroyed. Things aren't there anymore. So where do they go? What can they do? Uh, and things are not looking pretty. I mean, there are children who are orphans now. Where do they go? What do we do with all of these kids? And so it is going to take countries to come together to try to help with the rebuilding of Europe. 
Nazi leaders will be tried for their crimes against humanity and they will be found guilty. And these will be, this will take place during the Nuremberg trials. And you can still see today, every now and then it will show up on the news or, or online in a newspaper that uh, they have found uh, certain people who had participated during the Holocaust who were members of the Nazi party and committed various acts of atrocities or were part of a network that actually led to those acts of atrocities. And they are still being brought before um, the Hague uh, courts for these crimes against humanity. We definitely saw that women played a larger role uh, in the war economy than they did in World War I. And this time around, it's not gonna be as easy to have the women to go back home in those traditional roles. They enjoyed the independence, they enjoyed being able to make money and contribute, and they enjoyed you know, having a position outside of the home that they felt would be very you know, contributing to society. So a lot of women know they liked their jobs or they wanted to pursue further jobs. And what we also see is that two nations emerge as the two dominant powers, and that's gonna be the United States and the Soviet Union. They're the superpowers, uh, but with the United States having the atomic weapon, the atomic bomb, that does put us an edge ahead of the Soviet Union. And that's going to lead to some competition. And for a little bit, Truman will be able to dictate a few things, but the moment the Soviet Union has their own capability of creating an, an atomic weapon, the gloves are off and it is full on arms race and space race between our nations. So looking at Japan, we know the dropping of the two atomic bombs is going to eventually lead to VJ Day, victory in Japan, and then the signing of the uh, treaty to completely end the war and then to focus on how are we going to rebuild and recover Japan. You know, at the end of World War II, we do see things a little differently than we saw in World War I, where the nations do set out to try to help with that recovery. Uh, for Japan, uh, the U.S. does leave uh, General Douglas MacArthur there to oversee the um, revitalizing or rebuilding of Japan. And they set out to create a democratic nation uh, with a new constitution. Now, you'll notice that I have here that the new government that they're going to create will resemble Great Britain's instead of resembling the United States. You know, first off, they fought, you know, we were the enemy for Japan. And we ended up dropping two atomic bombs on them. So to force our type of government upon them may have been a little too much. But, you know, using Great Britain as a model on how to restructure their government to be a more democratic one, like a constitutional monarchy with a parliament, you know, it would fit easier because they had the emperor. And we didn't eliminate the emperor, that position. It's just now the power of the emperor is reduced to where it's just an symbolic figure. Um, the emperor holds no power. And that was why it took from August 14th until the beginning of September to finally finalize the paperwork because the question of what about the emperor? What's gonna happen with the emperor? So the emperor is a symbolic figure uh, just holds no power where people are not putting them on such a pedestal that they would just do everything for. Within the new constitution, um, again, Japan is, their government is turned into a democratic nation. So you see a two house parliament that people elect and all citizens. So that includes women over the age of 20 can vote. And we're also including a Bill of Rights, and we know the significance of the Bill of Rights. We had England's English Bill of Rights as our model. We established a Bill of Rights, and that protects people's basic rights from you know, a government becoming abusive. But we also included something else within their constitution, and that's Article 9, that Japan cannot be an aggressor and actually set off a war. They can defend themselves but they cannot be the aggressor because we see that the United States was pulled into this war because of the aggressive actions of Japan. 
you know, the going after people's uh, nation's colonies, and then that attack on Pearl Harbor pulled us right in. And the extreme measures that were taken by the Japanese military and the civilians on continuing this war, Article 9 is put in there. And, and that article has actually come up in, in um, previous years because of the conflict with North Korea and how North Korea is trying to exert uh, their force and testing some of their their weapons and missiles and getting a little too close to Japan. And, you know, the point is, you know, is Japan, would Japan have to break that Article 9 and how would the world, particularly the United Nations, see that? Chances are they're going to see that North Korea was the one provoking and being the aggressor in that situation. All right. So reminder, the three conferences that you need to know will be Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam. All right, that is it.